Good day, and welcome to the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, the importance of timely and balanced reconstitution of immunity, pre-bone marrow, stem cell, transplantation call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Jennifer Gillette. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Shelby. Yes, this is Jennifer Gillette. I am the staff social worker at the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link. I'd like to welcome you to our Lunch and Learn with the Link call today. This month's program will focus on the importance of timely and balanced reconstitution of immunity pre-bone marrow stem cell transplant. Um, a special thank you to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Insight Corporation, Pharmacyclics and Janssen, Omero Corporation, and our esteemed link partners for making this program possible today. Just so everyone knows how our program will go, uh, we're going to have a, a couple moments of introduction to the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, and then you'll hear from Dr. Young Bolins, um, who is an expert in the field, and uh, then we will have a survivor parent, Rebecca Nichols, and then we'll open the floor for questions for about half the hour, and then I'll wrap it up at the end for those, or for us. For those who may not be familiar with the link, our mission is dedicated to helping individuals and their families from diagnosis through survivorship. We provide resources, support, and education. Some of the resources we provide to help families navigate this transplant journey are our webinars, podcasts, blogs, and lunch and learn calls like you are on today. We have a variety of topics with these calls such as our chronic graft-versus-host disease talks, disease-specific information, caregiving, coping, treatment options, and survivorship after a transplant. We have an active Facebook page with daily inspiration and relevant tips for survivors, a peer support mentor program for patients, caregivers, and donors, a second birthdays recognition program, books, referrals, and emotional support from a licensed social worker. So please feel free to reach out to us if you're interested in any of these services. Before we begin today's program, I would also like to review just a couple housekeeping items to maximize the experience for all on the call. Please be mindful in being concise with questions so that we may answer as many as possible today. Also, please know that the information provided in this program is meant to stimulate conversation with your own health care provider and is not meant to replace your individualized medical plan. So now on to the educational part of our program. We're so thankful to have our first speaker here with us today, Dr. Bullens. He is a pediatric hematologist oncologist and currently serves on as the Chief of the Pediatric Stem Cell Transplantation and Cellular Therapy Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Previously, he spent a decade developing a cord blood transplant program in the Netherlands, which is now the largest in Europe. Dr. Bullens is continuing to build on this work by looking for ways to incorporate cellular therapies with transplants. He expresses a special interest in rare diseases, particularly lysosomal storage diseases, and is finding strategies to get better disease control in malignant diseases. Dr. Boland's research focuses on the development of advanced therapies made from cord blood that will target blood disorders at the cellular level, including the dendritic cell vaccines, he is also creating a mathematical model that can help predict how a young person's immune system will respond to receiving such treatments. Additionally, he is interested mm. in designing a predictable low toxicity conditioning regimen using PKPD models. Without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Bullen. Thank you, Jennifer, for this really nice and kind introduction. And I'm really happy to have the opportunity today to share with you some data uh, on immune reconstitution and uh, I hope I can convince you in the upcoming 20 minutes, 25 minutes, that immune reconstitution is really crucial for the outcomes after stem cell transplant. Um, so the main message for you guys today is that uh, the T-cell reconstitution, so that's the lymphocytes, 
is the most important predictor for outcomes. And outcomes is in the first place survival, but it also is important for, let's say, getting TVHD control. Um, I, I have my talk in um, divided into five parts. So first of all, I will explain you a little bit about the different cells of the immune system that we constitute after stem cell transplantation. After that, I will share with you the importance of T-cell, lymphocyte immune reconstitution. Thirdly, I will explain to you that agents, so chemotherapy, but also immunotherapy, that's given prior to the transplant in the conditioning regimen is important for the immune reconstitution after, after transplant, so the T-cell reconstitution. And that's the pharmacokinetics, so that's how the dose you get in the, um, let's say, conditioning regimen, um, how that results in blood levels can be highly variable between various patients, and that that can impact the immune constitution after. And nowadays, and that's where I will end with, it's um, important to know that we can better predict the T-cell reconstitution nowadays, and that's good news because that means that the survival chances are also better. So first, the different cells of the immune system that reconstitute after transplant. And the, the first cells and that's, uh, that reconstitutes are the neutral fields after transplant. And I, I think for those who have undergone a transplant, they, they all know in two, three weeks after transplant, one and a half week after transplant, depending on the um, transplant type, uh, the first thing you would like to know is uh, what's my neutral field count? What's my what blood cell, um, let's say, count, but mainly what's the neutral field count? So these cells, these neutral fields are also part of the immune system. They reconstitute first. And most of you know that the host, that these cells are important to fight bacterial infections, fungal infections. Nowadays, because we know better how to transplant, um, in almost all the patients, and if I say almost all the patients, more than 95%, more than 98% of the patients, they will reconstitute neutrophils. And again, that will take between two and three weeks. In some cases, some instances, maybe a little longer. But all the patients will reconstitute, almost all. And again, important for defense against bacteria and fungal. All the cell types that we constitute, and, and that's the main focus today, are the T cells, the lymphocytes. And actually, these cells are probably more important, or not probably, these cells are more important for the outcomes. And um, why is that? Because these T cells, these lymphocytes, they are important to give disease control. So that's control over your, let's say, cancer, but also important to control viral infections and some other opportunistic infections. So if you fail to reconstitute T cells after transplant, or if this reconstitution is delayed, the outcomes are worse because you will be able to uh, or you may face reactivations of viruses such as EBV, CMV, um, adenovirus. And these are viruses that you may have contracted before transplant, but your host immunity, your immunity was able to control these viruses uh, for years, decades sometimes. But due to the transplant procedure, your host immunity 
is wiped out and you're awaiting new immunity, new T cells to control these viruses after the transplant. And if this immunity that comes a little late, these viruses can become active again. So therefore this T cell reconstitution after transplant is really crucial to prevent serious complications after transplant. And awaiting these T cells, there are a couple of non-specific lymphocytes as well that can also control, but that's usually as a bridge to the T cell reconstitution. Some of you may have heard about NK cells. So these cells are derived from the bone marrow. So soon after the neutrophils are engrafting and giving normal numbers, also these NK cells are circulating in the bloodstream. But these cells, yes, they can control some viruses, but not for a long time. So this is more a bridge to. So, and these T cells, and we have studied that in adults, in pediatrics, if these T cells are delayed, again, the um, non-relapse mortality, the treatment-related mortality is um, higher. So how can you control this T cell reconstitution? What is important? So for you today, it's important that the early T cell reconstitution mainly comes from the T cells infused on the day of the transplant. Although it's called stem cell transplantation, the cells we infuse are not only stem cells, but it's a mixed bag of cells. And in this mixed bag of cells, there are also T cells. So that's one thing, the number of T cells we infuse on day zero. Another thing is the agents used in the conditioning regimen. So as you all know, before transplant, we have to prepare the body. We have to make sure, we have to, let's say, get rid of the diseased bone marrow. We have to get rid of the um, host immunity. And we, for this, we use chemotherapy, sometimes TBI, and immunotherapy agents like ATG or Kempat. So these are antibodies, these immunotherapies, that will bind to the host T cells and will wipe them out, will deplete them. But some of these agents can have activity after transplant because the half-life is a little lower. So having said that, you can also understand if these agents have an impact, we should also be able to control that, um, as well as controlling the number of T cells that are transfused or infused on the day of transplant. This, the T immune reconstitution is important for controlling viruses, for non-relapse mortality, so that's treatment-related mortality. And the T cell, reconstitu uh, T cell reconstitution is impacted by the number of T cells infused and by the agents given in the conditioning regimen prior to transplant. Let me focus a little bit more on the agents given in the um, regimen, in the, let's say, conditioning regimen prior to transplant. The way how the body reacts to chemotherapy, but also drugs in general, can be highly variable between individual A, B, C, D, and E. Because this, um, because the clearance, how the body reacts, depends on the kidney function, on the renal, on the um, liver function. For some of the agents, also on other things like number of lymphocytes number of white blood cells, um, weight, body surface. So there are a lot of variables that can impact the clearance of these agents. That means that if I give that patient A a certain dose, 
that may result in different blood levels um, in this patient compared to, let's say, patient B, who has a poor renal function, for instance. And the levels in these individuals will have impact or can have impact on the T-cell reconstitution after transplantation. So that may sound a little scary, uh, but we have found solutions because we have built models, that's the medical models Jennifer was talking about, that with studying hundreds, thousands of patients, we are now better able to predict how the body reacts to these agents. So based on not only the weight or the body surface, but also considering the renal function, the liver function, um, the number of lymphocytes circulating, we can impute all these variables in these mathematical models to predict the clearance, the drug levels, at certain time points before and after transplantation. And using these models, and that's what we have started here at MSK, but also in other centers around the world, we now better know um, how to precisely dose a transplant patient um, with a certain age, with a certain renal function, with a certain weight, to make sure that the levels are not too high and that the levels are not too low. Or in other words, to find a sweet spot that allows for the best immune reconstitution after transplantation. Um, and these models, and we recently have finished a clinical trial, and this was in the Netherlands, uh, the center I came from, we have uh, finished a clinical trial using these mathematical modeling to better predict the clearance of these agents. And we were able to show that the immune reconstitution using these models results in a 20 to 30% better immune reconstitution uh, in the cohort of, let's say, patients we have studied. Um, so I spoke about the pharmacokinetics. So what those does with the drug levels in the individual, let's say, let's say patients, and I showed you, and I explained to you that by using mathematical models, we are able to better predict uh, what these agents, what the immune reconstitution will be after transplantation. So um, let me summarize it here. So I explained to you that there are different immune cells reconstituting after transplantation. The first cells are the neutrophils, but a more important cell type that's reconstituting after transplant are the lymphocytes, in particular the T cells. And the conditioning regimens, so the chemotherapy and TBI given before the transplantation, as well as the number of T cells infused on day zero, predict the immune reconstitution after transplant. By individualizing dosing, by precision dosing, using mathematical models, we are now able to better predict immune reconstitution after transplantation, which makes transplantation safer and ultimately will result in a higher survival rate. So with this, I'm happy to answer the pre-submitted questions after Rebecca's story. And of course, I'm happy to answer a couple of other, let's say, questions that uh, may have come up after this uh, short presentation. So I hand over the word again to Jennifer. Thank you so much, Dr. Bowens. I We so appreciate you sharing the research that you have done, and this is certainly exciting to hear what can be done to help with better outcomes. And Dr. Bowens also uh, introduced us to Rebecca Nichols, who is going to be our survivor speaker today. Um, she has 
Uh, Rebecca has joined us to share what a new immune system for her son, Cameron, has meant to her and her family. Cameron, Rebecca's son, who is now a healthy three-and-a-half-year-old boy, was diagnosed with SCID at just 10 years old. This is a severe combined immunodeficiency um, disorder, which is inherited. It's a primary immunodeficiency, I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty chatting with that today, immunodeficiency disease that typically presents in infancy resulting in profound immune deficiency um, conditions, which uh, result with a weak immune system that is unable to fight off even mild infections. Cameron had a life-saving BMT at six weeks old at Memorial Sloan Kettering and they basically rebuilt his immune system, which saved his life. Rebecca was his haplo donor, and they were inpatient for the next five weeks, then went home and lived in isolation for about seven months. She now has a nine-month-old daughter, and all is well with her. And in fact, today, Cameron's doing so well, he plays soccer, soccer and eats dirt like a sweet little boy. <laughs> so anyway, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Rebecca to share more about her story and what this wonderful procedure has done for them. Rebecca. Hello, everyone. Um, so thank you for that introduction, Jennifer. My son, Cameron, is our oldest child. He was our first child. So when we got the results of his newborn blood screening, uh, he was 10 days old, and we got a call from our pediatrician, and they said they wanted to go over the blood work with us, and we had actually left the house for the first time with the baby not to go to the doctor's appointments, and we went back home, and the pediatrician called, and they said, okay, when do you want to see us? Let's make an appointment. And they said, okay, how about in an hour? And I hung up the phone and I told my husband and I, to leave the house with a newborn when they're 10 days old. I mean, it takes us an hour to get out the door. So he asked what they wanted, and I said, I don't know, but if they want to see us in an hour, it can't be good. So we went to the doctor's office. We made it close to on time. That was a big deal for us then. And they told us that his newborn blood screening, which is now done, this kid is one of the, I believe it's about 40 or 50 um disorders that are screened for in the United States, and SCID was not, at the time when my son was born in 2017, SCID was not screened for in every state, um, but now I believe it was the end of 2018, SCID is screened for every newborn um, that has their newborn blood screening. So it's something that's caught early on um, based on the blood cell counts. So the pediatrician explains that Cameron had low T cells and they had already set up appointments for us the following morning for a blood draw to redo the blood draw, the newborn screening, just in case it was a false negative, a false positive, excuse me. And they also had set up an appointment for us with an immunologist uh, specialist. So we were definitely scared and overwhelmed, and we had no idea what any of this meant. The only thing I knew about T-cells was that it's mentioned in a song from the musical Rent, and the characters have HIV or AIDS, and I knew this wasn't good. Um, we set a no-Google rule for ourselves. We Googled what T-cells were, and then we stopped and we put everything away and just waited for the doctors the next day because we knew that could be really scary to look things up. So um, the next morning, the immunologist was very helpful and gave us a lot more information in detail that our pediatricians um, I think they just didn't know enough um, because SCID is not a common occurrence. I believe today that SCID occurs in about one in every 55,000 live births. Um, and again, because there's screens in all 50 states now as newborns, that this is um, being caught much earlier. So when the immunologist said she was waiting for the, the um, revised newborn blood screening results from the lab, she was still going to approach treating our son, Cameron, as if he had SCID, even though it wasn't confirmed. Um, her referrals come from newborn blood screening, usually with a cutoff of about 200 T cells, and Cameron's count was close to zero. Um, she said if it was something, if he was closer to 200, she might take a different approach, but because he had almost no T cells in his newborn screening, she was going to treat um, his, start his treatment right away and put him on an... Um, I believe it was an antiviral uh, medication right away, and 
we were pretty much told to isolate at home, um, to not let people meet our son, to not expose him to germs and as few germs as possible because he didn't have the immune system to fight against anything. Um, so that was also very scary, but um, it was we were grateful that he was our first child, that we didn't have other children at home, we didn't have pets at home, we didn't have other people or animals that were bringing germs into our home that we weren't known or that we didn't know about. Um, and some of the protocols that have been put in place for the global pandemic um, were familiar to us because we did it a long time ago that we washed our hands a lot. Um, we learned a lot about germs and exposure, and we tried to limit really what we did outside of the home. Um, both of our parents met Cameron, and we made sure that um, if anyone was else, if they went anywhere, if they went grocery shopping, if they went to work, if they saw anyone that they showered when they came home, that they put on clean clothes before they came to our house um, to make sure that we were, again, exposing Cameron to as few germs as possible because we knew he couldn't fight against them. Um, our next step after seeing the immunologist was to be down at MSK. We met with Dr. Prokop um, about, I think it was probably just a few days later. And again, for us having no exposure or no knowledge about any of this stuff that was going on, the fact that we were being seen by a fabulous doctor at a specialized institution in just a couple of days was really just how urgent it was to get his condition treated. Um, so we found out with our conversations with Dr. Prokop, they did a lot of different testing and found the genetic mutation so that we it is not always inherited, but many times it is, and that I am a carrier for this mutation. Um, Cameron's treatment was, our goal was to have him transplanted before three months um, because there is a 95% success rate for skid babies that are transplanted before, in that time frame. And really our goal as his parents were to try to keep him healthy, um, to keep him as healthy as possible before we got to that transplant date. Um, they did need to wait a certain amount of time because he was a newborn. He had to be big enough and strong enough to be ready for a transplant, but at the same time, we didn't want him to go past that three-month time frame. Um, we wanted to do it as soon as his body would allow it to have a positive result. So Cameron, um, we went back and forth to Sloan Kettering. It's about an hour and a half drive from our house, and we were there probably two or three times a week for blood work, for appointments, um, to get everything set up for his transplant and we were admitted to the hospital. He had a week of chemo treatment to deplete whatever immune system he did have. I had my donor surgery and I believe it was the next day he had his stem cell transplant. He was seven weeks old and we were inpatient there so we it took another four weeks for us. Um, he had about two weeks of reconstitution where we were, um, as Dr. Bowen said, we were looking for those neutrophils and his neutrophils went down to zero, which was perfect for what they wanted for the transplant. And then it slowly started coming back up. So those two weeks were to get his immune system rebuilding or to rebuild his immune system. And then the last two weeks that we were there were working with that immune system and weaning him off of all the medications that he was on that were kind of functioning as his immune system when he wasn't making the cells on his own. Uh, we were discharged actually the day before Thanksgiving, which was very exciting um, to go back home. And we had our parents and Cameron's grandparents got to see him out of the hospital and we had a nice Thanksgiving dinner at home. We had so much to be thankful for. And after that, we actually went back to the hospital the day after Thanksgiving for our first follow-up appointment, but it was great to not be living in the hospital anymore, as I'm sure so many of you know. Um, we went to the hospital two to three times a week for some time for checking blood work and just kind of checking on Cameron and seeing how his immune system was doing, and we slowly went down to once a week and then every two weeks um, and down to every month and so on. Um, Cameron was allowed out um, of the house that to the, we were suggested, or the doctor said, like, he's free to go. We showed up for an appointment, and they said, you're going to sit in the waiting room over here, 
And I, I looked at them. I said, no, we go to the isolation room. And they said, no, you're okay. We'll check with the doctors. But you, they told us to have you sit here today, which we were shocked. We were nervous, but also excited because that was a big deal for us. And we were instructed to take Cameron out. And we went back later that week for our next appointment. And the doctors asked, what did we do? And we told them we went grocery shopping, that we went grocery shopping as a family. And they asked what else we did. And we told them that was it because that was a really big change for us. And it was really kind of scary. So they did encourage us to do more than that moving forward. And we did go watch Cameron's dad play hockey at a tournament the following weekend. And he met people he hadn't met before, and he was kind of, we called it out in the wild, but um, it was a big adjustment for us as parents to have him around people or have people around him and being exposed to germs that were everywhere. So um, Cameron was on still on medications, but by the time he was nine months old, he was weaning off of his medications. He was down to only a small amount of steroids. He received his first vaccine at nine months old. Um, We also got to have our first regular pediatrician appointment, and um, they slowly transitioned us away from our visits with our BMT team to having visits like regular children at the regular pediatrician. And Cameron had a line, a Broviac line for his blood work so that we weren't poking him every time for all of these appointments to draw his blood, and that was finally removed when he was 11 months old, and he was pretty much a normal kid by his first birthday. He caught up with all his peers with all of his vaccines by the time he was 18 months old. Um, we now go back to Memorial Sloan Kettering every six months. Uh, we have a follow-up with his BMT team, and we also have a follow-up with the long-term care team, and so they do scatter those appointments so that it's instead of both at the same time, we have balanced them. So it's every six months because getting blood work from a toddler has not always gone well for us. It's getting much better. We talk about the blue ribbon hug and the poke, and we, for the first time, did not have tears in November. So that was a big accomplishment for us. Cameron has started preschool twice a week when he was two, which was the fall of 2019. Um, He ended his year of preschool with remote learning um, because of COVID last year, but he joined the the kids, and he was in there doing I don't even know what, but he loved it, and we loved seeing him learn and grow, and playing with all the other kids was a really big um, accomplishment for him and for us, and he, we actually noticed that he gets sick less frequently than his peers, which was something that we were concerned about. Um, but as Jennifer said before, he is just a, a regular guy now. He's three and a half. He loves to run around. He loves the dirt. He touches every possible surface in a public restroom, and he licks things at the playground. Those are my two hardest things to handle. I know that any mother, even without having gone through this experience, cringes at those things, but I have a, like an extra cringe, and I just don't feel so well when I see him do these things. But he has to do it, and he handles it all well, and his immune system handles it well, too, which is the most important. So, Jennifer, back to you for the next well, round. Thank you for sharing your story. I do have a question for you, though. Uh, yeah. You know, it, I, as a parent myself, the level of fear I just imagine you must have had every step of the way. How did you and your husband cope with that as you were going through this process? So it was all, I would have to say it was almost helpful to be in isolation because we were isolated too and that kind of helped us that we could control our exposure to germs, but we definitely have a level of germophobia when we started kind of re-entering the world that we did not have before of our, and I feel like we've seen friends and family members develop some of these kind of habits that we developed a couple of years ago with things with um, the pandemic of touching surfaces and washing their hands and having sanitizer bottles everywhere. Um, But we really, we talked about it a lot. We talked about it with each other. We talked about it with the doctors that For us, the most important part was getting back to somewhat of a normal life, and we felt that the more that we 
not obsessed, but kind of the more that we obsessed about the surfaces and the germs, that it wasn't good for any of our mental health, that we didn't feel normal, that we felt like we were constantly worrying and that was impacting our day-to-day functioning. And so we really had a discussion as, as a family and said, like, we trust our doctors, we trust the science, we see his lab work, we know that he has these cells, like, we have to just trust that they're going to do their thing. And when we when they did the first vaccine, they did what they call titers, where they see the immune response after the, uh, I don't, I, I'm not a medical professional here, but this is my interpretation, was that they see how the immune system responded to the vaccine that he was given to know that he has those antibodies. And when we saw that his body responded appropriately to his first vaccine, that was really encouraging for us. Um, we did they checked the titers after his second vaccine as well, and then they kind of let us go and said, you're going to get your next vaccines at the pediatrician. Um, I think that that was our big, like, we, we really just had to trust in the science and methodology because that's what the doctors do. Like, this is their specialty, and we can just support him in every way we can with what we know, but we trust that they helped his immune system do what it needs to do. And we also know if it's not doing what it needs to do, we know who to ask and to get it looked at. I really appreciate you sharing that because I know no matter what disease, uh, trust and fear and all those things come into play. At this time, um, Dr. Bullens is going to um, answer some pre-submitted questions, and when he's done with that, we will open up the call to uh, any additional questions. So go ahead, Dr. Bullens. Thanks. Um, so there were five pre-submitted questions. Four are immune-related, so I will try to answer these four so the first question was from a patient who have gone through a stem cell transplant in 2019 and a CAR-T in 2020. And I think the first transplant would have been an autologous transplant and the lymphoma came back. And now uh, this, this patient will undergo a bone marrow transplant and I assume this will be an allogeneic donor transplant what should I expect to happen now for side effects and, re- and re- re- recovery after allo transplant? Yeah, so it, of course, that's not an easy question. It depends, of course, also a little bit on what the various more abilities are, what the renal function is, whether there are let's say, cardiac issues, whatever. But in general, if everything is fine, um, the reconstitution of neutrophils, as mentioned before, will be pretty fast after transplant. The T-cell reconstitution, a little bit depends on the graft type. So is it the T-cell depletion, um, ex vivo? um, Also a little bit depends on the agents used in the conditioning regimens, but generally speaking, nowadays the immune reconstitution should be um, pretty okay within 100 days. Uh, of course, having had these therapies before um, may make it a little bit more um, risk may increase the risk a little bit because uh, having an autologous transplant and a CAR T cell therapy before. But generally speaking, I expect that the T immune reconstitution should be okay. But again, it may depend a little bit on the, um, let's say, type of transplant you will get. So the second, um, let's say, question is about why do let's say, cancer return or relapse after um, transplants? Why do you see your own cells back? Actually, unfortunately, donor transplant is not a holy grail. Um, And generally speaking, but it a little bit depends on what kind of leukemia or lymphoma uh, or MDS someone has. The 
uh, relapse rates are on average between 25% and 30%. And how can you um, increase the duration of time to relapse? Again, here, immune reconstitution is important. So the faster you immune reconstitute your T cells, the less likely it is you relapse. Although that's not true for older uh, lymphomas, that's mainly true for the myeloid lymphomas and is, is less clear in the lymphoid lymphomas. But generally speaking, 25 to 30% of the patients relapse and immune reconstitution is important for certain types of um, leukemia lymphoma. So the third one is an interesting one, but that's another interesting one. It's about the vaccinations and response, um, the, let's see, antibody response after the vaccine. So this is from a patient three years after BMT for mantle cell lymphoma. And this, let's say, patient got a Moderna vaccination and um, he checked or she checked the, um, let's say, COVID antibodies and they were zero. Um, it's, it depends on what kind of antibody test has been done because you will only produce antibodies against the spike protein. So a lot of, so it doesn't mean that if the antibody tests or the antibodies are zero, you haven't produced antibodies because it really depends on what kind of antibody test has been done. And if you do not look specifically for the spike proteins, you may miss it in the standard antibody testing. So therefore, it's also not recommended to do standard antibody testings after a vaccine. So again, it depends on the, let's say, type of antibody testing. If this was a specific spike protein antibody, let's say, testing, then it's different, of course. But also important to know from the COVID vaccine that it's not only antibodies, it's also specific T cell immunity you will um, induce, which is specific for these mRNA vaccines. So in summary, it depends on the antibody, let's say testing done, because you really need to look specific for the spike protein antibodies and the, um, the uh, let's say RNA vaccine not only in, um, induce antibodies, but also specific anti-COVID T cells. The last one, is um, from someone who is 11 years after transplant for follicular non-Hodgkin lymphoma who underwent a beam preconditioning. So I assume this has been an autologous transplant. Um, but even when it's an uh, allogeneic, a donor transplant, I expect the immune system to be at normal. Of course, if you would like to know for sure, you have to I say test the immune system, but generally speaking, I expect the immune system to be um, pretty normal 11 years after transplant. So I, I hope this was an answer to the four pre-submitted um, questions. And I'm happy to answer some other questions, of course. Thank you. And Shelby, could you please uh, tell our callers today how <clears throat> they can ask more questions? Absolutely. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. A voice prompt on the phone line will indicate when your line is open. Please state your name before posing your question. Again, press star 1 to ask a question. We'll pause for just a moment to allow everyone an opportunity to signal for questions. We'll take our first question. Caller, go ahead. Hello. Yes. Hi. <laughs> hey. Hi, Dr. Boland. I'm sorry. Hello. Good morning. Dr. Boland? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, so I have uh, recently been diagnosed with MDS, so I have not gone through the uh, bone marrow 
or stem cell transplant yet. However, uh, talking about the neutrophil and the T cells, um, if there are some known viruses, you know, for example, the herpes uh, virus, mm -hmm. um, is there a, a, a high risk when you talk about those viruses are concerns uh, prior to your immune system or your neutrophil white blood cells coming back? Is there some concern or do they already anticipate if you, they already see that in some of your testing that you have a virus such as that? And also, um, is there any advantage in looking at um, institutions that might be more skilled at this, like uh, Cleveland or or um, uh, uh, any of those kind of uh, high-ranking institutions versus another? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the last question is, of course, a very tough one. Um, but the first question I can answer. Um, so most of the adults, actually all the adults will have contracted EBV. So that's one of the herpes viruses. And um, the donor you will, let's say, get, if this is a donor transplant, will um, also be EBV+. plus. So CMV, another herpes virus, it's, um, let's say positive in 60-70% of the patients. So if you have contracted CMV before or when we test you for CMV, we uh, notice that you have IgG antibodies against CMV. So we, we know that you may be, that you will be at risk to get a CMV reactivation. So what we typically do is try to select a donor that's also CMV plus, because if you transplant with uh, a CMV plus donor, you will also transplant CMV plus T cells, which doesn't mean that your risk is down to zero, but the risk is significantly down. And in the unlikely or in the event you may reactivate and your T cell reconstitution is delayed, there are nowadays also options to, um, of course, you can treat with antiviral drugs initially. If that fails, there are options to treat with CMV-specific T cells. So that's usually third-party T cells or they can also be donor derived, but it's usually easier and there are various trials and options open here in the US now to give you CMV specific T cells. But the best prevention is of course to make sure that someone um, has sufficient T reconstitution after transplant and that a CMV reactivation is prevented. So in summary, um, it's important to look at the um, characteristics of the donor to make sure that there is a match, not only HLA, but also uh, virus-wise. So if you are positive, we have to, they have to make sure that the donor is also CMV plus or EBV plus. But again, EBV, we, we all have seen in uh, adulthood. Does that answer your question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. And we'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. Hello. 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 Good afternoon. Yeah, uh, my name is George, and my my spouse carry multi myeloma on pancreas, and uh, up to three times spouse become nine centimeter and fifty centimeter on pe um, on pelvis. So. She was treatment of BRD for uh, two years, and the tumor is to disappear, but the doctor asked her to do a bone marrow transplant. But I think that because of medicine works so well, so ask asked them to do a maintenance chemotherapy for five years. So, so far, so good. But, you know, when is the best time to do the you know, bone marrow transplant? Yeah, so for this disease, that's 
for me pretty tough to answer. So uh, because and and we also mainly talking about the immune reconstitution. So I think that's for me, um, let's say tough to answer. It's also multiple myeloma. So uh, unfortunately, I I don't have a satisfying answer for you. So about this, yeah, about several years already. So. So, mm-hmm. so we just give it a maintenance chemotherapy, something like that, because both we cannot find the the tumor any any more because you know total remission. Mhm. So should should yeah. we stop the maintenance chemotherapy, or we just keep the maintenance chemotherapy? Yeah, that's uh, again that's too let's say difficult to answer by phone. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. that's that's not an easy that's not an easy, simple answer. Unfortunately, sorry. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, and you okay. had a very good presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And again, to ask a question, please press star one. We'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. Hello. 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 Hi, uh, my name is Rocky. For a patient with a triple hit uh, DLBCL who gets a complete first remission to dose-adjusted EPOC-R, is the Langford study from a few years ago that was, I believe, it's uncertain whether or not to go ahead with a bone marrow transplant, is that still the status or are there developments now to determine whether or not to go ahead with the bone marrow transplant in that situation? Um. That's, uh, I, I'm, I don't have an answer to that question, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Okay. That's great. Your yeah, presentation was, was, your presentation was wonderful. We couldn't appreciate it more. It's very helpful to us. Okay. Thank you so much. Pleasure. We'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi. Um, my question has to do with CAR-T as well. Mm-hmm. Um I had CAR T in uh, 60 days ago, and my question has to do with understanding T cell reconstitution in the vein of CAR T, because I've been told that depending on the CAR, uh, depending on the reconstitution, or you know, I guess I don't really fully understand that one avenue might be to do bone marrow transplant. If it's not, you know, if we're not getting the result needed, and I'm not mm-hmm. sure in lab tests what it is that I'm supposed to be paying attention to. So, what kind of car did you get for lymphoma? Uh, I got um, uh, kite. I got um, Yescarda. Yescarda, okay. And and for um, let's say lymphoma. It's DLBCL. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so that's um, the, the, and so this is generally speaking. Mm-hmm. We don't know whether we don't know yet whether it's better to um, use the car as a bridge to transplant mm-hmm. or use it as an end of therapy treatment option. And this is true for ALL as well as for lymphoma, Mm -hmm. as well as for myeloma. And um, some centers, and I hope there will be uh, some randomized controlled clinical trials soon. So you you have to realize that when you go to allo transplant, to use the car as a bridge to transplant, to, to achieve a deep remission and then give consolidation with the transplant, also mm-hmm. has risks. So we don't know, right. and in a pediatric population, because you can die because of the transplant, mm-hmm. uh, and that needs to be, in the end, the balance needs to be positive in the sense of that the survival is higher in the transplant group versus the um, CAR-T group. So I, I, I believe, and that's also what is shown in ALL and also in some smaller lymphoma studies, is that if you consolidate with transplant, the relapse rates are lower. But um, there is a cost there as well, 
because the, yes, there is low uh, relapse, but also a certain, let's say, percentage of patients do not survive the transplant. So is, in the end, the net effect positive? We don't know yet, unfortunately. So I, I, I would... Right, because I know CAR-T uh, is so new. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I hope we know more, but of course that is not an answer for you. Uh, I hope we have a better answer in a couple of years. And, and, and I hope, and I know there are some initiatives to start clinical trials to randomize between CAR versus CAR plus transplant. Right. Because that's the only way to, to get an, as an answer here. Well, thank and, you. And it's very helpful to know even that because, yeah. you know, the data is thin <laughs> right now. I know. It's, yeah, I know. I know. And So this yeah, is helpful and then, to know. Yeah. Okay, pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck. And we'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. Yes, hello. My name is Rhonda, and uh, I had a bone marrow transplant with my uh, son as my donor. And I'm two years out now, and I just recently asked my oncologist if my immune is, uh, I had the both vaccine, uh, um, Moderna, and if my immune is uh, good. And she said yes, but unfortunately, I just got recently diagnosed with another disease called myasthenia gravis, and the medicine they want yeah. to put me on will suppress my immune, so I believe I'm in a rock and a hard place because here I am trying to protect my immune, but now I'm going to get thrown into a pit where my immune is going to get po- compromised with this cell step, my, uh, the the medicine yeah. they want to put me on cell step. So now I don't know what in the world to do. So I told the doctor, I'm going to delay taking the cell step and try to manage the symptoms so that I don't put my immune system out here in a compromise. And I wanted to know what you think about that. Yeah, thanks for that question. That's a tough one. And I'm so sorry to hear um, this. Um, so one thing to consider. So the, the And they would like to prescribe you only the uh, cell sets. Well, no yeah, other they- immune supplement. Oh, you mean because they think they got mestinon, you could do mestinon, but he said that that's just a, uh, uh, a cover over. That's not the long term fix. But I'm worried about mm-hmm. COVID. <laughs> I'm, I got I, like I said, I'm in a rock and a hard place. Okay, you give me a long term fix and give me a drug that suppresses my immune, even though I have the vaccine, yeah. but yet here I am. There's COVID out here. I know, yeah. So that's a tough one, but uh, you, you have to balance. I don't know, and you, you can um, balance better as because it's your body. You have to balance right. the downside of the myasthenia, let's say, gravis versus um, the risk that's maybe a little bit increased because cell sept is not a very, is not a super immune suppressive. Agents, so it will suppress the immune system a little bit, but not super severe when you, for instance, have to take cyclosporin or let's say tecro or a combination of tecro plus MMF um, cell sept. So, yes, it will suppress the immune system a little bit. Um, so, you have to balance the risks and the discomfort you um, have to deal with uh, with an uncontrolled or not optimally controlled myasthenia gravis. So it's, yeah, so it's a balance. But what I can say is that MMF or CELSEP is not a super immune suppressive agent. So it will suppress the immune system, but not very deep. Oh, good to know. Good to know. And also with me and, already and, having and, both vaccines, yeah, and and you have the vaccine in, and you have responses, and 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 it also doesn't prevent you to take a booster in a couple months or in a year from now for the COVID, because that's very likely what's going to happen. That we all need to get a booster after uh, six or nine or twelve months. Um, okay. Yeah. 
And also here by the, uh, for the cell theft, what I can share with you, and I think your physician knows, here he or she can also measure levels to make sure that the levels are not too high and not too low. Uh, because when it's too high, you will suppress the immune system, obviously, deeper and more than when the levels are in range. So that's oh. something you can ask the physician. Oh, thank you so much. So ask them about measuring the levels? Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, thank you so very much. This was excellent information. I appreciate it. Pleasure. We'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi. Um, I had a stem cell transplant back in 2019, and I'm currently on maintenance rituximab. Um and I did read up and see that rituximab makes vaccines not take, so we actually stop my vaccines till I'm done with the rituximab. But I was kind of in the same boat. I had the Pfizer vaccine, but our concern is because I'm on rituximab, I won't have any immunity against COVID, so I've basically just been trying to stay out in public uh, as much as I can. What is your view on this? So that's an important question as well. So it's, yes, with the rituximab, it's very, it's, you will not make antibodies. Right. But these RNA vaccines will also induce um let's say, T-cell activity against COVID. So, in other words, having no B-cells, having no antibodies, does not mean that you will not be protected against the COVID. Um, And I think it, it may be less, but it's not that you don't have immunity against the COVID because it's very likely you have produced specific anti-COVID T-cells that are also important in fighting the COVID. Right. The way I saw it is I didn't want to get the other vaccines because there was no guarantee that they would take. But yet when the vaccine for COVID came around, I figured any protection is better than none. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. So thank you for that. Thank okay, you. pleasure. I am so sorry, but our hour is up, and I, I just want to thank our speakers. This was a wonderful presentation. I hope it really helped all of you on the line today. Um, we thank you for sharing your research and all of your knowledge, Dr. Bullens and Rebecca, for your story and, and giving people that sense of hope. And uh, I, I also want to thank all of our callers for joining us today. Um, just so everyone knows, next month our Lunch and Learn will be on CAR-T uh, cell therapy. So feel free to reach out to us to sign up for that or look out for the information when it comes. And if there is anything we can do to support you on your journey, feel free to reach out to us at 1-800-L-I-N-K-B-M-T. Again, I thank everyone, and I wish you a wonderful day.